Thank you, Plateau Bronze. We're grateful for, the, uh, for your performance this morning. Let's give them another hand. A great way to start off this service. I want to just welcome you this Memorial Day weekend to uh, Central Baptist Church. We're so grateful that you've come today. If you are a guest, uh, I'd like to invite you to look in the pew in front of you and take that uh, communication card and fill that out so we could have a record of your attendance today. And uh, that'd be a way that we could touch base with you and hopefully uh, minister to you in some way. And if you're watching online, there's also a Connect card there that serves the same purpose. If you would fill that out, we would appreciate that. And uh, last week, uh, when we, uh, I just got back from Peru, and I thanked you guys for praying for us, but I didn't have any uh, slides or anything. I wanted to just draw your attention. I'm still grateful uh, this week that you prayed for us. But uh, if you'll see, three weeks ago, Pastor Roland uh, signed this agreement with the Peruvian Baptist Convention. And then the, go to the next slide, if you would. And then two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to sign it while we were there in Puerto Maldonado, Peru. Uh, that being the, that's the president of the Peruvian Baptist Convention and a couple of uh, the other leaders there and, and uh, Gordon Horn along uh, with me, and then one last one, uh, we've mentioned to you a young couple, Blotty and Carol, and uh, we had a time to uh, lay hands on them and pray for them. So I'm going to ask you to, uh, as, as this is mentioned, as you think about it, uh, be praying for this partnership, that, uh, that it would be fruitful, it would be effective, and that many churches would be planted there uh, in Peru and surrounding areas. Now, that's international missions. I want to say a word about local missions. Uh, Vacation Bible School, one of the greatest outreach tools that any church has. And you've got a insert here today. And here's what I want you to do. Let me tell you what not to do with it, okay? Do not hold on to this as a reminder for yourself. The purpose of this is for you to give this away this week to uh, a family that has children. And I'll, I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret, a little detective skill that you can use. If you drive by a house and you see a swing set, or if you see bicycles in the front yard or something like that, or if you see children actually running around outside, Take this, stop by. If you don't know what to say, simply say your name and you're from Central Baptist Church and say that one of our pastors asked us to stop and hand this to somebody that has children. All right, so if you can't think of anything else, uh, tell them that. But please don't hang on to it, but give it away. Now, this morning, as we uh, pause and pray for this service, we, we want to be thankful for those uh, who have given their lives so that we could have the freedom that we have today to worship. In addition to that, let's also thank God for the many through the centuries who have given their lives so that we could hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Join me as we pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we want to pause and just praise your holy name. We want to bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, it's our privilege to bow in your presence and to worship you. And Lord, that's what we want to do ultimately today, is worship you. We want to bring honor and glory to you. So, Holy Spirit, we would ask that you would move among us, move in our hearts, and that we would be obedient to the way that you move in our lives. Lord, we want to say a word of gratitude to you for all of those who have given their lives for this nation. Lord, we pray that 
you would help us. We, we can't, we can only be responsible for ourselves and our congregation. Lord, we don't know what the rest of the nation is going to do. Lord, we, we want them to turn to you. We want them to look to you. Lord, I pray that that would start with us. Help us, Lord, to be faithful believers during these days. And we do pray for our country. Father, we also want to just thank you for the many who have gone before us so that we could hear the gospel today and be forgiven of our sins. Lord, we think of people like the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter. Lord, we think of John Huss. We think of William Tyndall. So many who gave their lives so that we could have our Bible in the English language. Thank you, dear Father, for all those who have gone before us. Lord, I pray, should we be called upon to give our lives for our faith, that you would give us the wherewithal to do that. Lord, again, we commit this time to you. Be pleased is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Scott. Would you please stand and join us as we sing See a Victory in What a Beautiful Name. It's going to be led by our one and only Mr. Charlie Sutton. So sing all along with us. Here we go. Weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory.
Charlie. You may be seated. We are blessed in this place with, the, with so many people who love music, who love the Lord, who love sharing through music. And we're going to have several groups for you today that have been working hard on their selections. We're going to have the uh, Senior Adult Choir. We're going to have the um, Sweet Assurance Ladies Ensemble. We're going to have Eye Singers. Uh, you heard the handbellers. And uh, praise team, and our own celebration choir with our band. So um, we will now present for you our selections, starting with Senior Adult Choir and the Old Gospel Ship.
sing our God reigns. Our God reigns. Let the redeemed of the Lord sing hallelujah.
You may be seated. Tomorrow we as a nation pause to remember Memorial Day, to celebrate Memorial Day, and to honor those in our nation who have given their lives while serving in the United States military in its branches. In the book of John, John 15, Jesus' words, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. That's what we do today. We come to honor those men and women who have given the ultimate sacrifice for their friends, for you and I, for our nation. I read something uh, this week, and I want to read it to you. I thought it described Memorial Day very fitting. Monday. Monday will be the most expensive holiday on the calendar. Every hot dog, every burger, every spin around the lake, or time with friends and family is a debt purchased by others. This is not about all who served. That day comes in the fall. This, is, this one is in honor of those who paid in life and in blood, whose moms never saw them again, whose dads wept in private, whose wives raised kids alone, and whose kids only remember them from photos. This isn't simply a day off. This is a day to remember that others paid for every free breath that you and I ever get to take. Freedom. Today we want to honor those men and women who have died while in military service, who have family members of of part of Central's family. And so we have a group of veterans this morning that are going to come and read those names. If your family member is mentioned this morning, would you rise to your feet while their name is being read? Austin Jonathan Adams, son of Robert and Misty Adams, served in the United States Army, specialist, fourth class, served during the Persian Gulf, died of PTSD. Charles Blankenship, brother of Jenny Alsop, Sergeant, United States Army, served in Vietnam, died from exposure to Asian Orange. Levi W. Bond, great-great-uncle of Rich Bond, served in the 15th West Virginia Union Army, missing in action between February 16th and September the 3rd, 1864, at Berryville, Virginia, during the war between the states. He was only 21 years old. Robert Lewis Brown, uncle of Kathy Knoll, second lieutenant, in the United States Army Air Corps, 758th Bomb Squadron, killed during World War II, July 15, 1944, in Posetti, Romania. Billy Carter, cousin of Gene Ford, served in the United States Army, killed in Vietnam. Henry Daniel Jr., son of Rich Grant, private first class United States Army, served in the tank battalion under General Patton's Third Army, World War II, died on November 16, 1944 in France. Alexander Sandy H. Davis, MD, uncle of Laura Fritz, Lieutenant in the U.S. Navy, died in a kamikaze attack on the USS Pinckney, a hospital ship, 
in the Pacific Ocean during World War II. Nicholas August Doden, first husband of Jeannie Becker, first lieutenant helicopter pilot for the U.S. Marine Corps, died in Vietnam June 6, 1965. Samuel Clay Dyer, grandfather of Carolyn Curtis, private, U.S. Army, served in World War I in France, died of pneumonia September 30, 1918. Clayton Ford, uncle of Clyde Ford, served in the U.S. Army, killed in World War II. Kevin Eugene Ford, son of Clyde and Jean Ford, private first class in U.S. Army, died in a car accident while stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Tom Allen Glenn, brother of Quentin Glenn, U.S. Army, radar repair specialist, Vietnam, died after the war due to emotional stress. Stephen Michael Hackney, uncle of Joan Evans, served in the U.S. Navy, died in the attack on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, December 7, 1941. Frederick Andrew Hassler, cousin of Anna Norris, sergeant in the U.S. Army, killed in Vietnam. Arnold C. Haywood, cousin-in-law of Judy Warren, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army, 101st Airborne Division, killed July 11, 1969, in Vietnam. Richard E. Huey, brother-in-law of Janet Smith, lieutenant in the U.S. Infantry, killed in France during World War II. Roy Jennings, uncle of Leland King and Teresa King, served in the U.S. Army, World War II, and the U.S. Air Force, Korean War served in World War II action in European theater. He was one of the survivors of the sinking of the USS Dorchester, February 3, 1943. The ship is known for the four chaplains that gave their lives. Killed in training mission plane crash in Belgium, 1951. George Albert Johnson, great, great, great grandfather of Chuck Allspaugh, served in the US Army his regiment participated in the Battle of Chickamauga, died February 28, 1865, from a wound suffered September 1864. Joseph Robert Jones, brother of Mary Jones Kelly, sergeant in the U.S. Army, Served in Vietnam, 1968 to 1970. Died from Agent Orange exposure. William Charles Kelly, Jr., brother of Sarah Southall, captain in the U.S. Air Force, died in a plane crash in Germany, 1961. Kevin C. Kimberly, nephew of Wayne and Nancy, uh, Kathy Kimberly, Staff Sergeant, U.S. Army, died in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Doyle Edward Kugler, brother of LaVon Thompson, first lieutenant in the United States Air Force, died in a plane crash. Marvin Kurtz, Jr., first cousin of Leanne Smith, U.S. Army private, killed during World War II. Roy McCorkle, brother-in-law of Francis Ashley, uncle of Bill Ashley Jr., sergeant in the U.S. Army, killed while crossing the English Channel during World War II. Rufus McKee, uncle of Janet Smith, private in the United States Marines, killed in Iwo Jima during World War II, 1945. 
James Place, relative of Debbie Ostrich, died of starvation in Andersonville Prison in Georgia during the war between the states. Oscar Ratliff, brother of James Ratliff, served in the United States Army Airborne Division, died in Vietnam. Richard Sensian, great uncle of Debbie Yoho, served in the United States Navy, lost at sea during World War II. Charles Schaefer, great uncle of Marilyn Tom Rice, served in the United States Army, killed in World War II. Tyler Jeffrey Skelly, grandson of Joan Evans, Sergeant, United States Marine Corps. <laughs> Died April 29th, 2000, 2014, from an accident in Bahrain in the Middle East. Simplify. Oscar Stedman Jr., uncle of Rodney Smith, Captain United States Air Force, Army Air Corps. Captain Stedman was a squadron leader of B-17s. The pilot was shot down and killed over Italy by German fighters in World War II, November of 1943. Captain Stedman Stedman was 25 years old. James Edward Taylor, the brother of Carl Taylor, U.S. Army Private in the 100th Infantry. He died in World War II in an assault in France. Thomas Edward Testoff, the brother of Susan Noble, it was a spec for the U.S. Army 101st Airborne Division it was killed in Vietnam. Jeffrey Taylor Wright, excuse me, Jeffrey Dean Wright, brother of K. Schlick Rudnick, served in the U.S. Army as a Special Forces. He died in Vietnam on May the 22nd, 1968. We all celebrate Memorial Day in different ways. If you have probably lost a loved one or a close friend, you think of this day in the somber note and you remember those people. If you're a veteran like myself and you've lost a comrade in arms, you remember those folks that you served with. But for many of us, it's just another holiday. It's a weekend that we get to spend with our family. Maybe you take the... Uh, take a um, family out for a picnic, or you go on a boat ride, or you have barbecues, or you look at it as a day off from work, and that's fine. But I want to tell you a short story how it changed how I thought about Memorial Day, because my dad also served in the Marine Corps. I had uncles that served in all branches of the service. They did their time, they came home from the war, and they lived their lives. But in 2005, by that time, I was, had been in the Air Force for 30 years, and I had deployed all over the world with our fighter jets. Our squadron was tasked to deploy to Balad Air Base, Iraq. And I was what you could call a seasoned veteran. I had been there, I had done that, I had seen it all. So my sole mission, I took 350 aircraft maintainers and a squadron of F-16s to Iraq. My sole mission was to get home with all 350 of the folks that I took over there. I didn't have to work on the aircraft. I, I had risen to rank enough to where that was other people's jobs. My job was to get us there, do the mission, get us home. So we deployed in July of 2005. 
a couple of days after we were there, you start seeing these emails come through and they were talking about a Patriot detail. I didn't really know what that was and I started inquiring about it. And the base that we were at, it was kind of the staging base for anyone that was killed in action that they would bring their bodies back to Balad Air Base and they would prep them before they sent them home. We worked 12 and 14 hour days in Iraq. We never stopped flying. Our job was to fly combat missions and we kept F-16 in the air 24 seven in case there was troops in contact on the ground. We were loaded up with bombs and missiles and we could come in, drop ordnance and get, uh, get them taken care of. So we always were flying. But once I found out what this Patriot detail was about, I encouraged my shop chief to let their folks participate in that if the mission pre presented itself. Like I said, we worked 12 and 14 hour days and about two or three months into the deployment, uh, once again, another uh, Patriot detail came across the email and it was about 6.30 or seven o'clock in the evening that it was gonna take place and seven o'clock was my scheduled time to get off. So I grabbed my, my clerk and my computer specialist. I said, come on, we're gonna, we're gonna go and, and participate in this Patriot detail. What that entailed was we were to meet on the tarmac and they were gonna be bringing the body of a soldier or an airman or a Marine Corps sergeant that had been killed in action and they were going to load their body on a transport to bring them back to the States. So there was about 200 of us that showed up on the tarmac that evening. And the clerk that I had with me, she was probably 25. My IT specialist was, was in his early 20s. And there was 200 of us lined up, about 100 Army and 100 Air Force. We made two columns. At the end of the column, an ambulance pulled up. And out of that ambulance came a flag draped coffin. And as they walked that coffin between us, we all saluted the coffin. And I'm here to tell you, this seasoned veteran had tears in his eyes because in that coffin was a 19 year old army private. I didn't know his name. All I know was he was killed by an IED. And I thought, here this young man came over here to do his duty, like we all did. He enlisted. No one forced him to join the military. He didn't want to go to Iraq. I didn't want to go to Iraq. My troops didn't want to go to Iraq. But that's what we enlisted for. And that 19-year-old private gave up his life for our country. And I thought, what a greater gift to give to someone and it reminds me of what, what Jesus did. He gave up his life for us. So this, this seasoned veteran had tears in his eyes and I was so thankful that I did that. And I was so thankful for the grace of God that he let me and my 350 troops come home when it was all said and done. So this Memorial weekend, it looks like it's gonna be a pretty weekend. I hope you get the chance to have barbecues or maybe go to the lake and enjoy yourself. But I want you to remember that 19-year-old private that did not come to his parents in September of 2005. But more importantly, I want you to remember that right now, serving in all corners of the world are 19 and 20-year-old kids serving our country so it allow us to come home and have these picnics and have this time together with our families. So you remember them tomorrow when you're remembering Memorial Day, because it certainly changed the way that I now remember Memorial Day. Let's pray together. Father, once again, we come before you with gratitude and thanksgiving for men and women who have given the ultimate sacrifice the, so that we today can come into this building and worship in freedom and in spirit and truth. God, we ask blessings upon the families who have lost loved ones. God, that you would minister to them 
Holy Spirit, that you would pour your spirit out upon them and that they would know you, Jesus, as their Lord and Savior. Bring peace and comfort to them today. Bless them, and we pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. History has taught us that though freedom and liberty may be the path most sought, it is seldom the road most traveled. It is also important to note that the pursuit of true justice, more often than not, requires the greatest sacrifice from the just. We use these words so easily, and for so many of us, the rights offered came so easily. However, we must never forget the sacrifices made, the promises kept, the costs incurred. We must never lose the beauty and the harmony of the sacred song of freedom.
wow. It is interesting, is it not, to stop and really think about why we celebrate Memorial Day, the price that was paid. I want to ask you to take your Bible, if you would, and turn to Revelation chapter 13. We're going to continue this morning a message we began last week about the beast from the sea from Revelation chapter 13. Now, one of the things that we're trying to do is to get people to open their eyes. You know, sometimes when you're not looking for something, you miss things. You don't see things. Uh, I played a trick on you uh, within the last month. I went to the barber, and uh, when I got the haircut, I noticed she had parted my hair on the wrong side, combed it on the wrong side. And I thought, well, I'm just going to play this out and see if anybody notices. So I went through a full week on purpose. Uh, the only one who noticed was my wife. I, I guess that's not to be surprising. But no one else said a thing. Staff meetings, church service, uh, all the meetings, nobody noticed because you weren't looking for it, right? It's easy, you know, to do that. Now, by the way, Billy did the same thing just not long ago as well. <laughs> and you didn't notice it with him either. Uh, Billy, for, for those who don't know you, stand up, Billy. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we both have played a trick on you, and uh, no one noticed. We want to open our eyes and begin to see things because we're looking for things. This week was a horrible week for our nation. If you saw the events that unfolded in Texas, you cannot help but be heartbroken. And if you want to see what evil is all about, just look at the innocent murder of little children. You know, the Bible says that in Proverbs 6, for example, that God hates the one who sheds innocent blood. But I see it from a little different perspective than some of the world. I see it as another indication that our Lord may not be far away because 2 Timothy 2 and 3, excuse me, 2 Timothy 3 says that in the last days, perilous times will come. I think we're seeing that lived out. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Now, when we think about the Lord's coming, I want you to know something. Most Christians get excited about that. I know I do. When I start thinking about the Lord coming and realize it could be, could be sooner than we think, I get excited about that for at least three reasons. Number one, the early Christians got excited about it. When you read through the New Testament, you find that again and again and again, they talked about the second coming of Christ. And they used phrases like this. After talking about what was going to happen, he said, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Or when they talk about the second coming, they call it our blessed hope. They were excited about the fact of Jesus coming in. That's the first reason I like it. Second reason is because God likes it. It was God himself who inspired the biblical writers to write the things. It was God who inspired the different um, get-togethers, the, the, the um, uh, times that they were together to decide what is Scripture and what is not. It was God who oversaw all of those things. And the third reason I like it is because the devil hates it. <laughs> it, is the, it is the event that seals his doom more than anything else. It is the coup de grace for him. It is the signal that his time has run out. And so I like to think about the second coming. Now, I don't want to bore you by going over the things that we went over before last week, but let me just kind of refresh your memory about a couple of things. We're talking about a man who is coming up out of the sea of people. Um, he is a man as surely as you and I are a man, but he's going to be different from most men. He is what the Bible calls the beast. Now, this man is alluded to all the way from the first book in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3 talks about the seed of the serpent. And all the way till the end, the book of Revelation talks about him. In many places, you go through the, the book of Daniel, and you'll find several times that Daniel talks about this, this one who's coming. Uh, and it's just found throughout the Bible. So, you know, he is a beast, not because he is horrible to look at. As a matter of fact, I suspect just the opposite will be true. I think he'll be very handsome. I think he'll be witty. I think he'll be clever. I think he'll be insightful. And um, he's not a beast because of his appearance. He is a beast because of his character, who he really is. Now, last time we talked about the fact that uh, Satan was God's ape according to Martin Luther, and we simply meant monkey see, monkey do. Whatever God does, Satan duplicates. And so if God has a son, Satan's going to have a son. This beast is the equivalent of his son. And what you find as you read through the book of Revelation is that this beast is the contradistinction to God's son. 
And you'll find as you go through that there are all kinds of contradistinctions. There, 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 there are different things that are, are shown to contrast one another. For example, you'll find the story of a lamb in Revelation, but also that of a beast. You'll find a Christ and an anti-Christ. You'll find a bride, the church, and you'll find a harlot, the false church. And it's that way throughout the, the Bible. You'll see the son of God and the son of perdition. You'll see the man of sorrows and what Paul calls the man of sin. You'll see the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent from Genesis 3. You'll see the truth and you'll see the lie. And all of these things just are diametrically opposed to each other. Now, this beast that rises up out of the sea, uh, it's talking about him rising to power out of a, a turbulent sea, Isaiah 57 talks about. There'll be a lot of turmoil, a lot of chaos, a lot of heartache, a lot of school shootings, if you will, that are going on. And out of the sequence of events, this leader steps to the forefront and the world accepts him. Yea, they worship him. Now, we're going to read about that in just a moment. But there's kind of a, a, a series of uh, stages of this thing as you think about it. First of all, there is a stage of apathy to the things of God. Then there is a stage of apostasy from the... Uh, from the things of God, not just, not just apathy to the things of God, but apostasy, apostasy from the things of God. Then you have anarchy, which comes in the absence of the things of God. And then ultimately, you'll have the Antichrist, who is the opposite of God. Now, one European statement said, said this, and um, talking about this beast who is to come. Um, in the book of signs that David Jeremiah wrote, he said this. He quoted, actually, Paul Henry Spake who was the first president of the European Parliament, part of the European Union. And he said this, we do not need another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to, uh, to, to uh, hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man and be he God or devil, we will receive him. Doesn't matter <laughs> whether he's a, 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 a god or a devil. Another European statesman said this, if the devil could offer a panacea for the problems of the world, I would gladly follow the devil. So this mindset is already there. They're already thinking when this one comes, they're going to follow him. Now, what's holding back this man right now in all of this evil? Well, if we are indeed in the last days, there's only one thing that holds him back. And you know what that is? You. You see, it's not you per se. It's God who lives in you. When you read 2 Thessalonians 2, you'll find an in-depth uh, analysis of this beast who's coming. And one of the things that it says in verses 6 through 8 is this, and you know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed. I believe that removing this influence is what we call the rapture. You see, when you and I are gone, as far as the world is concerned, their enemy has left the scene. They don't like us because we stand for things that are good. We stand for things that, are, things that are right. We stand for things that are even holy on some occasions. And they cannot stand that. They want the freedom to do what they want to do when they want to do it, and they don't want us getting in the way. And so when this, this influence that we have through the power of the Holy Spirit is removed, then they're free, and the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2 um, that, that they will he will be revealed. Now, uh, we stopped last week while we were thinking about Roman numeral number three, the appeal of the beast. And uh, let me just share just another thought or two on that. The beast has appeal to the world because of his power, uh, because of his authority that the devil has given him. Now, you remember in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, the Bible says that his coming is with all power and signs and false wonders. Those are the very same words that are used to speak of the Lord Jesus. I mean, he is, he is powerful, and they're going to be attracted to that. It's going to be appealing to them. Every now and then somebody will come to me, and they'll say, you know something? Uh, when I was dabbling in the occult, 
I learned that there's truth to that. It was powerful. It was real. And sometimes when people delve into this area of the occult, they actually think that that validates it. That makes it good. Listen, no, it does validate it, but it doesn't make it good. It's all the more reason to stay away from those things. There really is power there. The devil is very powerful. Do you remember when Jesus was tempted in Matthew chapter 4? The Bible says that the devil took him up on a mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, Jesus, if you'll fall down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And Jesus said, well, Satan, you can't do that. No, he didn't say that because he knew Satan could. That's why Jesus didn't rebuke him and say, you don't, can't do that. You see, the Bible says this whole world lies on the lap of the wicked one. And he could have given those kingdoms to Jesus. And, of course, Jesus would not, would not give in. Now, uh, <laughs> he is very powerful. And that's why people will say, who is like the beast? Let's, let's uh, pick up the story, if we may. Revelation chapter 13. And uh, notice beginning in verse 5. There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth and blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Now catch that. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written in the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Now, skip down to verse 11. Well, in fact, we'll, we'll wait and pick up there in a moment. But let's just think about this now because here is this one who is, um, who is um, so sharp, so crafty, so persuasive that the whole world follows him and actually begins to worship him. In fact, um, we read last week when they, they, uh, they asked in verse 4, they worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? And who's able to wage war with him? I mean, they look at him and they say, there's nobody we've ever seen like him. This guy really does have the answers, and he will. This guy's a man of peace. Now, their thinking will be something like this. The idea of the people would be that, well, if we don't turn our power over to somebody, we're going to destroy ourselves. It's inevitable. We're going we're to destroy ourselves. So we need to invest our power in one person who is good. And you see, if he's good, that's a good thing for him to have all the power. Because you see, if he has all the power, no one can make war with him. And since he's so good, he can't make war with us. So war will be gone. Now, isn't that a, a, a rational philosophy? That's what they're thinking. Who is like the beast? <laughs> There's no one like him. You know, I would remind you that talking about the beast, the Bible says this, it is by peace that he will destroy many. You see, he is going to be a man of peace. He'll actually make a seven-year peace covenant, according to the book of Daniel. And it will be a time of genuine peace. There's no war going on. But out of that peace... He ends up destroying many, and that's some of what you read in Revelation chapter 13. I would also remind you that 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 13 says, and when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. Now, he claims to be a man of peace, and he wins his way, but he is not a man of peace. Now, let's move on and think, if we may, about the fourth point, ambition of the beast. What is his ambition? Well, he has several. I want you to realize the, the fact of the matter is, according uh, to verse 4, he wants to deify himself. They worship the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who's able to wage a war with him? He has always wanted to be worshipped. And by he, I mean the devil. The devil's always wanted to be worshipped. And here's a chip off the old block. He wants to be worshipped too, and he will be. They'll actually worship him. Now, some people would say, Pastor, in this day and age, do you really think that they will worship someone? You betcha. Sure they will. When you read about European statesmen who are saying, we're just looking for the man, we'll follow him. You may not realize it, but the emperor of Japan is God to the Japanese people. You may not realize it. We don't see it this way, but Kim Jong-un in North Korea, 
is considered God. They worship him. I was reading a report just this week by uh, uh, one of our national security advisors, and he was talking about his his time that he's been observing Kim Jong-un. And, and in that article, he just mentioned, you have to remember, he is considered God in North Korea. They don't question him. Of course, it would cost them their lives if they did. But, but he is, to them, God. It's been that way for a long time, folks. I mean, Hitler was considered a God, especially in the days prior to World War II. They worshiped him. And he made statements like this. He said, I will finish what Jesus Christ started. See, they want to be worshiped. They want to be followed. And so that's his first, um, his first uh, ambition. That's the first thing that he has on his mind is to be worshiped. I mentioned uh, back at Easter time, the, this matter of Vladimir Lenin. And um, if you remember, we put on the screen some, some photos of him. He's, he's still on this earth. He's embalmed. And they have him in a, a glass sarcophagus in uh, Red, on Red Square, in Red Square. And uh, for 100 years now, right at 100 years, people have walked by and see him. They leave it open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, except when they go in to wash him down with formaldehyde and the other chemicals. I mean, you understand why. Nobody wants to wash their dirty linen in public. And... Uh, I know I don't, but anyway, uh, but you remember what they have written there at his tomb? He was the savior of the world, of Vladimir Lenin. He was the savior of the world. No, he wasn't. There is a savior for the world, but it's not Vladimir Lenin, and it's not, it's not Adolf Hitler, and it's not Kim Jong-un. It's not any of these people. It is only the Lord Jesus Christ. But first of all, he wants to deify himself. His second ambition, to defy God. Notice in verse 5 and 6. There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Now, for those who are a little more um, in tune with, with uh, the second coming features, you realize he's talking about the second half of the Great Tribulation. 42 months, three and a half years, 1,260 days, three ways the Bible talks about that time period. But uh, for two and a half, excuse me, three and a half years, he's going to, uh, to have exceeding power, according to verse 5 and 6. And his goal is to deify himself and then to defy God. Now, he'll blaspheme God, but he also blasphemes you. Now, he can't touch us because we'll be in heaven. But you'll notice the way he says it in verse 5 and 6, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. I believe he's referring to us there. We've already gone to heaven by this point in time. He can't get to us, so he resorts to name-calling. He blasphemes us. He blasphemes the devil. There is like a, um, a volcano of filth and debauchery inside of him, and when he opens his mouth, it, it just pours out like lava. Uh, he, he is going to be something as far as being blasphemous and, and defying God. But he also wants to not only to deify himself and to defy, defy God, he wants to destroy the saints. Notice, if you would, in the first part of verse 7, it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. You say, well, Pastor, I thought you said we were in heaven. Who are the saints he's going to overcome? Well, it's really fascinating. When you read through the book of Revelation, You'll find in Revelation chapter 7, there's a great, great revival that takes place. There are 144,000 Jewish Apostle Pauls who are roaming the earth, and they're spreading the good news about Jesus Christ. And there's a great multitude that's saved, according to Revelation chapter 7. In fact, they're gathered around the throne, and they, 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 uh, uh, you know, they, they, their number is too large to count, it says. It can't be counted. There are going to be millions of people saved because can you imagine having 144,000 men who were just like the Apostle Paul, for lack of a better example? Um, can you imagine that? And people are going to be desperate. They're in the middle of the Great Tribulation. They're going to be desperate. And so, so they do. Uh, they are saved. And these are the ones who are destroyed by Satan himself. And by the way, the reason they're around the throne is because they've died for their faith. You see, it's given to Satan to be able to destroy them, and he does. Now, 
Another ambition he has is to dominate the nations. Notice, if you would, in verse 7, the last half of the verse, an authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. He will be the man in charge over all the earth. Now, you may say, wait a minute, we're, we're pretty good at sizing up things, and I just don't know that we would all let that happen. Yes, we will. We sure will. When the Bible says the whole world follows after the beast, that's what it means. Uh, you know, we're not going to be smart enough to figure all this out, those who are left behind. And so uh, they're, not, they're just not going to be able to do it. And as a result, whether it's by hook or crook, he's going to dominate the nations. He's going to be over all of the nations of the earth. And then notice a fifth ambition that he has, and that is to delude mankind. Notice in verses 8, 9, and 10. And all who dwell on earth will worship him. And everyone whose name has not been written, um, you know, who's not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb, has been slain. Now, skip down, if you will, to verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke, and he exercises. And that's not the verse I'm looking for. Um, anyway, he comes to deceive in verse, verse um, 8 and 9. We'll worship him. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, I'm looking for where he deceived them. Doggone it, I wrote down the wrong verse. See, that's why I ask you to always follow along in your Bible. I could make a mistake, and you'd never know it. So uh, you follow along, and you'll, you'll see these verses. But, but at any rate, uh, verse 14, okay, thank you. He deceives those, there's my word, he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast. He's a master deceiver. Now, he will deceive the world. He's hoodwinked them into this peace covenant, and so um, he is, he is uh, <laughs> he's going to deceive a lot of people. And we live in the age of deceit. I read this spring, and I don't know if you noticed it or not, but there's a technology called deep fake technology. It's amazing. They can show and create a picture of you doing something, and you didn't do it. But through the use of, of the, the powerful technology we have, even artificial intelligence, they are able to show someone doing something that they didn't do. Now, here's where the scary part comes in. At the highest level, those who are supposed to be able to detect the fakes said they can't. Now, let your mind wander with that for a while. Someone, if they wanted to, could absolutely destroy you, me as a preacher, with deep fake technology. They could show, and, and it's amazing. With, with artificial intelligence and everything, now they can actually take my sermons online. And, um, you know, if, if I had used profanity, I, I choose not to. Uh, I will tell you, there are some preachers who have, and I don't understand all that. But, you know, if you, uh, if you have the proper technology, you can create a video of me and make me say anything you want me to say. They can go back for years and pull up any word and just make me say something I didn't say. That's scary to me. Don't think that you won't be deceived, that the world won't be deceived. And again, I don't believe you and I'll be here, so it's not our problem. But just don't think that they're going to be able to figure it out. They will be deceived, just hoodwinked completely. Now, we're going to go ahead and pick up, if we may, with the uh, fifth point, and that is the associate of the beast. The associate of the beast. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this because, Lord willing, next Sunday morning, that's what we're going to think about. But let me just say that this first beast has a press secretary. He has an agent, if you will, who um, will do his bidding and who is a lot like him. You'll find it beginning in verse 11 when he saw another beast coming up out of the earth, literally the land. Now, this beast is coming up out of the land, and there are a lot of scholars who indicate that that what is meant by that is simply this, it will be a Jew. Now, that's interesting. Now, the first beast came up out of the sea of humanity. And by the way, there, there are a lot of different, uh, we'll look at some of this stuff next week, but there are a lot of different thoughts about who this beast will be. Um, I, I've told you before, some people think it's Scott White. I really don't think so. <laughs> 
I, I, I've called him the beast, but I really don't believe that most of the time. And uh, um, Joel Richardson has a book. I, I was taught, John Walvoord and, and so many of the people that I, I read through the years always believe it'll be a, a European leader uh, from, from Europe, particularly out of the European common market. But Joel Richardson had a couple of books that I read that were fascinating to me because he thinks that this will be a Muslim beast. That's fascinating. That opens up a whole... And, and obviously, he spent some time letting you know why he felt that way. It's worth your reading if you're, if you're interested in this sort of thing. But uh, the second beast comes up out of the land, and that's why... Uh, so out of the sea, we don't know where he came from, but out of the land, the land is usually referring to the land of Palestine. And so there are a lot of scholars who say, this guy is going to come up from the land of Palestine. He's probably going to be a Jew, but he's going to be fascinating as well. Now, uh, again, he is a part of this false trinity. You have the devil as the equivalent of God the Father. You have the first beast as the equivalent of God the Son. You have this false prophet, this third beast or second beast, uh, who is the equivalent of the Holy Spirit. His job is like that of the Holy Spirit, to encourage worship. To, to encourage you to worship him. And he's going to do it through a couple of ways. Now, if you want to fill out the outline, the way he'll do it is, first of all, he will be a master of miracles. In verse 13, it says, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. Now, what will that be like? We don't know. Some say maybe, maybe nuclear fire. Uh, we don't know. Would it be a fire like you find in, in uh, the story of Elijah, where Elijah called down fire from heaven and consumed that, that wet offering that was there? We don't know exactly. Uh, it could mean several things. But we do know this. He's going to be a master of these miracles. Um, you know, he's, uh, according to verses 14 and 15, he's going to prepare a, uh, um, an image of the beast and command that people worship him, and he is going to give that beast, that image of the beast, the ability to talk. And we don't understand all that this means, but my point is just to say this. Why will people follow him? Because he's a master of miracles. I mean, he's doing stuff nobody else can do. That would get your attention. The second reason that they will follow him is because of his mark. You'll find that, and we'll go into much more detail about this next week in verses 16 through 18. You've all heard of the mark of the beast. Um, the number is 666. Six is the number of a man. Three is the number of God. So most people would say that this is a man who proclaims himself to be God. But the key point, and one we'll hone in on next week, is this. He will control your buying and selling. Now, we think it's a little tough, and, and, and I'm sure it is for those mothers who are trying to find baby formula right now. But imagine if you could not buy or sell anything without the mark of that beast. Put you in a whole different world. And he will have the ability to do that. They will not buy, they will not sell unless they have his mark. And so the world really will be under his thumb. <laughs> it's real interesting because in Revelation chapter 2, when the Bible talks about Jesus, it says he's going to give you a new name. When you come to Christ, he gives you a new name. But when you come to the beast, he gives you a number. You get the choice, a name or a number. <laughs> that choice is yours. Nobody can make it for you. You have to make your own decision about what you're going to do with the insight that you have. But what will you do? I guess the big question is this. When the end of time comes, will your name be called or will your number be up? You get the choice. Let's bow our heads for a second, if we may. That choice is yours, and yours alone. Dad can't make it for you. Mom can't make it for you. <laughs> no one can make it for you. You must make that choice. And don't think you can leave here and not make a choice. Because to choose to not choose is making a choice. You're saying no. You see, there's only two answers available, yes or no. What will you do with Jesus? Will you crown him as your Lord and King? 
Are we not? While no one else can make that choice for you, if you choose wrong, you'll pay the price. But if you choose right, somebody else will pay that price for you. His name is Jesus. He loves you more than you can imagine. He is waiting on you to say yes to him. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word that is alive and quick and sharper than any two-edged sword. God, I pray you'd help us to make the right choices in our lives. For those who've never been saved, Father, I pray that today they would make that choice to follow you. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us a new name written down in glory, just like we sing about it. And it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. <laughs> Thank you for that new name. And that one day you're going to call us home to be with you. You've been preparing that place for 2,000 years. And one day, Lord, we're going to go there and be there with you. Thank you for the prospect of the future that we have as compared to the world. I pray, Father, those here today would make the right choice. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and you're dismissed.